to see you are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true. Even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy, you are the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and my death is lost, it's still. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough And nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reign And you are more, you are more than my words will ever say You are Lord you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. And you are here, you are here, in your presence I'm made whole. You are God, you are God, oh, of all else I'm letting go. Side of his grace and mercy. He's a jealous God. He wants all of you, not just the Sunday you, not just the small group you, or the youth group you. We are his. He is ours. Let's sing, he is just. I am 
Jealous for me, come on, church, sing. He is jealous for me. Oh, yeah. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree.
amazing when the songs become testimonies. It's incredible when the lyrics jump off the page because you just went through it. Or you're just coming out of it. But all in the meanwhile, if you could still sing how great, how wonderful, and how marvelous is your God. then you understand the gospel. You understand the victory we have in Jesus Christ. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, sing how great, how great is our God. H to H, come on church, H to H. Ah, uh -huh. 
For meeting us here, God. It's not lost on us. We came to meet with you. We feel you in this place. Like a rushing wind, we feel you, Lord. Would you anoint today's message? Would you bless the fellowship? Would you keep the coffee hot, Lord? We just love you. You're so amazing. No song could ever really capture just who you are. But we've got eternity to try and try and write new music and sing new songs and sing old songs. How great is our God. How great thou art. Beautiful Jesus, wonderful Savior, amazing counselor. That is our God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Are you in over your head? Are you in water so deep you're drowning? Do you think you've been left? And there is no one to feel you're hurting. Well, everybody is in pain here. Uh, we're in this series called Stand, and last week we talked about standing out and doing what God has asked us to do, and this week we're going to talk about standing up. A lot of times we fear confrontation. We get to this point where we hide when something comes up. By the way, if you have a teen, they are walking out of the door right now to go to their own service, and we would love for your teenager to join them. So they, uh, they, they, they just go right around the corner into a room over here. So if you have a teen here and they want to go hang out and hear something that's more relevant to them, then have them go. Um, so... As we're in this message, we're starting to look at it, and today we're going to talk about really standing up, standing up for what's right, standing up for what we believe in. And so when you start listening, and we're talking about Daniel here in this thing, and, and, and over the next couple of weeks, next week we're going to talk about standing strong for what's right, standing in faith, standing firm. This week we're in Daniel 4. So if you have a Bible, or if you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. But open to Daniel 4, and really just kind of start, kind of, as you're listening to me in the background, because I know a lot of you guys just tune me out as I start talking. Um, 
you know, just kind of start reading a little bit into, into Daniel 4. And, and really, he stands up for what is true here. You know, Daniel, he, he, he has this opportunity to really sit out and go, you know, I can just say something and kind of end it. I don't have to continue going on and on. I don't have to continue expanding on what I'm talking about. And he really, he comes out and he stands up. Doing something wrong, stand up. That's what we're supposed to do. When we, when we see somebody, you witness somebody that's doing something wrong, it is your job to stand up. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes we stand up incorrectly. Sometimes we don't stand up the way we're supposed to. Some of us, we don't even like to be confrontational. Some of us, we just stand back and we're just more naturally non-confrontational. We just stand back and go, uh, we don't even like to raise our hand. Even during service, it's so often that we come to service and we go, oh, maybe I, oh, no, uh, people are going to judge me and they're going to confront me and they're going to do these different, and so we get to this point where we don't even want to stand up. Some of us, we don't have a problem confronting at all. Some of us, we just come up and go, yeah, but we do it very harshly, and it sounds very judgmental. You know, and then there's like people like me, where you look at me and you go, man, Mike, you said that very harshly, and it came off, it came off very meanly, and, and, and you know, I'm very direct. You know, some of us, some of you guys are sitting in service right now waiting for me to say something wrong. You're like, ah, oh, I got my notepad. I'm waiting for him to say something wrong. You know, <laughs> That's exactly, some people do, oh, uh, and, and it's just how we do it, but that's okay. That's what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to take notes. We give them to you to take home, so that way you can come back and go, Mike, you said this, and maybe that was wrong, and I go, well, yeah, I'll, I'll look into it. If I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. There are two confrontational extremes, though. Inside of your notes, the first one's going to be some of us are just unwilling to, con to confront. We are just not willing to confront. We look at it and go, that's none of my business. I don't care. Let them live and let live, right? And, you know, we've heard that statement over and over again, and then we go, ah, oh, you know, who am I to judge? Anybody ever heard that? You know, uh, just let, you know, they're okay, it's none of my business. You know, it's, it's not something for me to really get involved in. You know, it, I'll just let them live, they'll let me live, they'll stay out of my business, and who am I to judge? These are, these are common statements that we hear over and over and over again. The bad part is, is that a lot of us, we try and be sneaky, and we'll set up a baby monitor in somebody's house and just sit out in front and listen to all the dirt that they have going on. By the way, I don't do that, and so when you're asking if I read your journals, I don't read your journals, I don't see any of that stuff. But I just got a baby monitor, I just sit out there for hours on end, you know. <laughs> some of us, some of us, we, we can, and these are extremes, and some of us we confront unlovingly. You know, we do these drive-by confrontations. We, we walk by and go, you know, you really did that wrong, and just keep going. It's no, no unli there's no love, there's no nothing to it. It's just a, just a complete drive-by thing. You know, and, and, and we get to this point where we either don't take a stand or we stand up in the wrong way. We get to this point where we just, yeah, I'm going to let it go, or we become, you know, where people start looking at us and go, you're a judgmental Christian, you're a hypocrite, you're this. These are all lines that are very well known if you're in church because you hear them all the time. You hypocrite, you judgmental person, you're this, you're that, you're this. Can you turn on that air conditioner for me, please? Um, and so you start hearing these. You know, when you start seeing different things, you know, our children make bad decisions, you stand up there and you try and confront it, don't you? You know, it's your own children. You go, I got to fix this. I got to confront it. And I got to help them grow. You know, when you have a relative that tends to manipulate people, you, know, you, you, you try and you start warning people about it. You know that. You've got some people around that you know that they manipulate over and over again. And as a spouse, what will happen is, is that you'll go, hey, uh, you know so-and-so is trying to use you, right? You know that's what's happening. They're using you for this or they're using you for that or this is going on. These things happen. You know, it, it, or your spouse should come to you and go, hey, I feel like you're taking me for granted. You know, these are things that are, you, you'll confront then. You won't confront when people around you are, you know, what happens when somebody's inside of your life group and they're having an affair? Do you confront them? Or do you go, oh, I kind of know something's going on there, but I, I'm not going to say anything about it. No, we're called to actually say something about it. We're called to help. And not just come in and go, hey, you're a lying, cheating, do, 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 whatever it is. We're called to stop them and help them grow and help them get correction from it. And the problem is we don't do that. Instead of confronting them directly, you know, it would be like me coming up to somebody and going, hey, and I, I can't use names now because then all of a sudden you go, oh, so-and-so's having an affair. But I would say to somebody, in a, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I see. And it's time for us to change it and it's time for us to fix it. Instead, what we do is we go, as guys, we go home. Because, you know, we go guy code, right? 
That's what we say. Oh, there's guy code. I can't say anything about that. Then you go home and you run your mouth all to your wife. <laughs> this is what's going on. And then what happens is, is your wife talks to the other person. And all of a sudden, instead of you confronting, instead of you going, hey, let's fix this, now you've created a divorce. Now you've created a relationship that's going to be broken. Now you've taken something and you've made it to where it's been, you've taken a relationship that could have been salvaged and you've destroyed it. And that's what's happened. Because we didn't, come, you know, we didn't confront love. Instead, we went and talked behind their backs and we did things wrong. Now, if you start looking at, if we open up and you're reading Daniel 4, you'll start looking at what Daniel does. Daniel opens up and it, the story starts with King Nebuchadnezzar and he comes out and he's like an evil king. You know, we'd start looking at this and you would be able to see that, you know, Saddam Hussein would be like the reincarnate of, of Nebuchadnezzar. He, you know, he was, he was just, you know, he's just evil. He was just an evil person that would kill his own people. He had no problem with that. Tons and tons of pride and he, and he stood up and goes, this is how it's going to be. Now, this king, he, you know, he has this dream and it rattles him. It, 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 it just takes him into a whole new level and it rattles him. And he, and he gets to this point, he's like, and he starts calling people in. And, you know, and the interpreters, the people that, you know, we, we hear this line. Now, when we hear this line now, we think of like gifts of the spirit. And this is the same thing. Remember in Daniel 1, he was gift, given the gift of being able to interpret visions and dreams. And so he's got this gift where he can interpret and he starts looking at it and, and, and but the other interpreters couldn't and they wouldn't interpret it. Or they, they just looked at it and they go, I don't understand what that means. I don't know what's going on. And so the king calls Daniel. Dan he calls Daniel in and Daniel is going to do what is right. Daniel comes in and goes, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to step up and do what God has asked me to do. Now the dream starts out and he goes, this is a, it, it's a, it's a large tree in the middle of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar comes up and I've got this dream in the middle of, I see this, this large tree. Now, it grew, it grew tall and strong. I tried to say those two words together. And it grows up, and it, it becomes like this tree that reaches to the heavens. And this tree provides life. It's got fruit and shade, and the birds are, you know, the whole world benefits from it. The birds are nesting in it, and it's, it really becomes like this whole tree where, you know, the problem is, in his dream, he starts to see what it transforms. The Holy One from heaven comes down and scatters all the fruit. It chases the animals from the shade and cuts it down to where it's just a stump in the ground. Now, the interpreters, maybe they didn't want to say anything about it. They didn't want to come out and go, hey, this is what you, you know, and most of it is, a lot of times it's fear. When we see something, we don't want to start talking about it because we have this fear. It sits within us and we go, ah, I better not talk about that. I better not come out because what are the repercussions? What is going to happen? And, it, and, and this king likes to threaten them. Oh, you can't interpret my dream? Well, all, all, all of you guys. That's literally what he says. He goes, I will kill all of you. He says, I will kill you sorcerers. I will kill you, you know, all the wizards. And he calls them this. So everyone knew that the Most High kind of rules over the kingdoms of this world. And Daniel doesn't like what he hears. Daniel doesn't like it. He hears this. And he gets back and he, and he, and he gets, he's like, I'm really sorry. I don't like this. I don't like what I'm hearing right now. And he, and he really, he gets to this point where he goes, you know, I think I'm going to retire from dream interpretation. And he, and, he, and he goes, maybe I, uh, maybe I ate too much pizza last night and I got indigestion. I don't know what it was that kind of made it do it. He got to this point, but that's literally what kind of, he's like, I'm just kind of done with this. I don't want to continue doing this. I don't like what I'm hearing. And he, and he kind of retreats from it. Some of us, we can kind of know some of these, some of these dream interpretations. If you start having these, you'll, you, they kind of just stand off to you. You know, if you're falling, you know, you ever have a dream where you're falling? That's like something that you can't control. That's really, that's kind of, you know, when, when that happens, it's kind of, it's just, that's, you know, what we, we also have, like, as you're a kid, you had these, you know, you had these dreams where you were flunking an exam. You had this exam, and you're like, ah, oh, what it is, is really, you just don't feel prepared. These are items that as you start looking at it. If you ever get stuck, if you're ever in a dream and you feel like you got, like, in a bear trap or you've been stuck, that means you're feeling overwhelmed. These are all kind of things that happen in your dreams when you see them. They kind of, they, these are what happen. You, you, some of them are just kind of obvious. You know, when you start seeing dirty water, if you, ever, if you ever have a dream and you have dirty water in it, chances are you're sick. That's just kind of one of those things that's your body identifying that. You know, um, <laughs> you know, if you dream about chocolate, anybody in here dream about chocolate at all? Anybody? I dream about chocolate all the time. And, you know, it's, I told you, you don't get this big without dreaming about chocolate and eating. You know, 
But if you dream about chocolate, that means that you feel that you have done something and you need to be rewarded. So if you ever dream about that, that's kind of the mindset about it. You need to be rewarded. If you ever dream, that, anybody ever have to dream that you have to go to the bathroom? Anybody? That means that you get up and go to the bathroom before you urinate on yourself. That's what it means. You know, that, that's, that's the honest answer there. <laughs> you know, anybody in here ever dream that they have, where they're naked? Anybody of those ones? If you ever have that dream where you're naked, you, 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 it really is that sense of insecureness. That's what it is. You're insecure about something that's going on. There's kind of some things. My wife, she had one of these dreams one time. She came downstairs. Melissa comes downstairs and she goes, I just had this awful dream. And I go, oh yeah? You had an awful dream? What happened? You married somebody else. And she was angry at me. And I go, wait a minute. <laughs> did this happen someplace? Did it, I mean, did, did I do something? She's, She's like, no, I dreamed it. I go, okay, why are you mad at me then? What happened? What did I do wrong? I, 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 I was pretty sure that I was sleeping too. I don't understand it. I didn't have that dream. And so, you know, she wakes up mad. She goes, what's wrong with you? What do you mean what's wrong? What's wrong with you? Is really what it answers the question. These are the type of things that we have. It's usually something that's going on. And it, it, oh, we, we need to confront lovingly. So when you start, inter you know, start seeing your dreams and your stuff like this, and I say lovingly, you should wish this for your enemies. When, you're, when your enemies start hearing this, you should want to confront them lovingly, and you should wish this for them as well. You should make it to where they hear it, and they, they, you should want to talk to them and go, hey, look, we need to talk about this. Daniel stands up to the king because it's the right thing to do, and he wants the king to know God. Now, I asked you this last week. I even put it out there. We are going to have an opportunity to stand out. We're going to have this opportunity to stand out as Christians. We're going to get this chance. It's going to happen. Did you take the opportunity for somebody to know God? Did you take it? Because it happens time and time again. It is the right thing to do. Did you take that opportunity for somebody to know God? So often we let those chances and we let them slide by. They just go and go and go and go. And we go, well, why is it that they don't know and they don't go to church someplace or they don't have that? It's because we have let the opportunity slide by and we don't get them the opportunity to know God. And it really, when he interprets this, he says, Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong, and your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends, extends to the distant parts of the earth. You will, be, you will be driven away from people, and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched in the dew from heaven. Several t seven times will pass for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots mean that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. This is what Daniel comes out and says. Now, he comes out and he's, this, that's the interpretation. He gives him this, he goes, you are that tree. Now, he could have stopped before giving the, you know, he could have stopped right then. He could have stopped and he says, when you acknowledge that heaven rules, he's like, I did my job and I interpreted the dream. I can stop right now. I don't have to go any further. You don't have to hear anything else. But then he comes out with the next verse and he comes out and he goes, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. This is exactly how we should confront. Please accept this. We shouldn't come out and go, hey, dummy, come here. We don't do that. We should come out and go, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. This is what Daniel comes out and does, and he's very lovely. He, you know, he's going, hey, look, listen to me. This is what the deal is. You can stop and you, everything will grow. It will continue. Now, isn't that what happens? Is that in our lives, we get to this point where we continue and we have sin going on. And we know that if we stop sinning, things will start growing. Look at us. Look at what we do. We go, God, why aren't you blessing my home? Well, have you been doing what he's asked you to do? Have you been doing all the things that he's asked you to do? Remember, he told you, I want you to love others. I want you to love me. And I want you to do the things that I've asked and go out and make disciples. And so go, God, why aren't you blessing my home? Why aren't you doing these things? What are you doing to show that? You know, God, why aren't you blessing me financially? Well, have you been tithing to your local church? Have you been doing what he's asked you to do? Have you been giving at all? Have you been just sitting on the sidelines going, oh, they just got it made? Because I'll tell you right now, is that 90% of churches in this world, 90% operate on 10% of the giving that comes in. Operates on, it, it, literally, 90% of churches 
They only live on about, you know, they, they, only 10% of what they could actually do. If everybody in church tithed, could you imagine how much more the churches could do? Could you imagine what would happen? You know, they would be able to live on 100% of that potential. They'd be able to grow and reach some more of the kingdom, reach more of the, reach more of the people, but we don't do that. And we go, well, God, why aren't you taking care of this? Why aren't you blessing? Why aren't you doing these things? Because we've forgotten to do what he's asked us to do. God, why is this things happening? Have you stopped sinning and started following the plan that he's asked you to do? Then I will allow you to prosper. Then I will allow you to grow. Then I will allow these things to happen. I mean, it's time and time again. Haven't you seen what happens over and over and over again in the Bible? Here's what happens. The Israelites, they go out, they think, oh, I can do it without you, God. And they seem to do fine for a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years. Then what happens is they fall away from God completely. And God goes, I don't like that. It's time to put you back into enslavement. And then back, so from Egypt to, you got from Egypt to the Babylonians to all these different, every time, enslavement, enslavement, enslavement. It's because they started sinning and fall away from God and decide they want to do their own little plan instead of doing what God has asked them to do. We are those people now. We fall away from God. We get to this point where we go, I got it. I can take care of it. You can't take care of it without God. You can't. You try and think that you can. You go, oh, I am so good at what I do. I, I've got it. That is you talking, not God talking through you. You need to start realizing that everything you have comes from God. Everything. Everything you have. That cup of coffee that you might be drinking right now, it came from God. That's where it came from. You know, it, it did. He helped grow the tree. He helped give us the money to, provide, to buy it. He, he, all of these things, God allows to make it happen. Well, he does the same thing at your home. He does the same thing with your children. He does the same thing over and over and over again. This is what, this is what God allows to happen. God can take it all the way. Open up the book of Job. You know, look what happens when he takes his hand off. And he goes, I've removed my perfection. I've removed my protection. And look what happens. Look what happens to Job. And now granted, it's kind of a far cry from what can happen to us. But literally, Job loses everything. But when he... He, he remains faithful. He continues doing what God has asked him to do, even though he's going through all this turmoil. Instead, Because the first thing we do is when we go through turmoil, we go, God, why is this happening? I hate you. All of a sudden, we end up losing and we continue to fall and we start asking these questions. Why aren't I prospering? What's going on? And Daniel, he comes out and he goes, dear brothers and sisters, well, in Galatians, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you, who are godly, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Now listen, because here's what happens. You remember, as Paul gives us these instructions over and over and over again, he goes, hey, you're growing, now you should go help other people. Go be like them, help them grow. But don't become so much like them that you start sinning like them. Because that's what happens. So we go to help people grow. We go to their, you know, we, you see it over and over again. You got people that show up to church. The next Friday they're out partying at the bars. And instead of reaching people, they're, they're, they're literally there actually tearing themselves down and they're falling into sin. It happens. You know, it, what the funny part is, is that, and I'm not saying that going to the bars is a bad thing. Because if you know me, then you knew that I worked in a bar and you knew I, I've done that. And I'd go, and I'll go. But what happens is I go outside and I have these biblical conversations with people. I go outside, and I'm out there trying to talk to people about church. They hate me at the bars. I show up, and they go, man, I was here to get hammered, not have a conversation about God. And I go, nope, I'm here to help you grow. I'm help you, trying to get you into church. I'm trying to do these things. And a man named Bill Easton used to sit at the end of the bar every week at a Friday night, and he would drink orange juice and hand out Bibles in church, or hand out Bibles inside of a bar. Can you imagine that? You went to, you went to a bar, and a guy's there, and he's just giving out Bibles. He said he had some of the most in-depth conversations, and by the way, 20 years ago, that man took that same place, that bar, started doing service there on Sunday mornings and grew a church of 4,000 people out of it. So you can literally make it happen inside of a bar. It doesn't matter where you're at. You can speak the gospel and talk to people and help them grow, no matter where they're at. But you have to do it lovingly instead of judgmentally and coming in and going, hey, I want to help you grow and I want to help you get through all this. Not showing up there and going, what's wrong with you? Why are you drinking? What's wrong with this? And what's wrong? Go where they are. That doesn't mean that we have to do what they do. There are lots of things in this world that are legal that I choose not to do because they are unethical and they are unbiblical. Lots of things in this world. 
That's how it has to be. You have to look at it and go, I'm going to go out and do things, and I'm not going to fall into the same temptation myself. Prayerful confrontation. This is where you look at it and go, God, help me confront with the goal of restoration. Guys, have you noticed? We have this thing here. We call it the Restoration Project. Why? Because we want to help people grow and get back into the fold of God and help them get back connected. We call it the Restoration Project because that's what we go out. We help restore people. Gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. The goal cannot be of being right. The goal is helping them be right. The goal of helping others be right with God. That's what our goal has to be when we confront. Not to go in there and be like, nana nana boo boo, I told you I was right. No, that doesn't work for you. That doesn't work for them either. That's not confronting lovingly. That's actually helping, that's hindering them. It's taking them down. Approach matters. Approach matters. So when you start going through this and you start looking at what goes on, approach makes a big difference. How you talk to people makes a huge difference. When you come up here, you guys laugh and stuff because often I'm crude. Because I get up here and I like to laugh and joke and I like to have you guys walk out with something that's a message. And so, but you look at it and go, I could have a different approach and you would walk out with a different message at the same time that we're doing right now. And remember, how you talk to people makes a big difference. Obviously, here's the next one. God, help me confront with caution. We have to. We have to make sure that when we confront others, we confront with caution. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. When you are confronting, guess what? You are vulnerable to pride. You have this huge thing and it become, you become very vulnerable to go, ah, I stood up, I'm right, I know I'm right. You become very prideful. And what that pride does is that guess what happens when we get prideful, we get knocked down. It tears us up and it knocks us down off, of, off that little pedestal that you just put yourself on. We see ourselves above people, you know, and we see others below us. Remember something, all of us are below God. So you have to remember that. You are not above anybody else. You're not below anybody else. All of us are below God. I say, I've said it before in lots of services. We have to make sure that we remember that God is the lead of this story. He is the main character of what we do. We are all supporting actors and actresses, and we are helping the story. And we can all get Academy Awards. That Academy Award is what, that, that date that we're waiting in heaven. That's what can happen. We can have that right now. That's, that's completely open for us. But we have to support, instead of thinking that we are the main characters, we are not the main characters of the story. We're not. We are supporting actors. Stop thinking of yourself as being Denzel Washington in a movie or whatever it is, because that's not you. You're not Adam Sandler or whoever, whatever movie's out now, I don't know, I, I, I don't get a chance to go to the movies anymore. You know, he, he, the other thing is you have to remember, it's like, you know, what happens is, it's like a guy will confront another guy about porn. Hey, you should stop having, you should stop watching porn. And the problem is, the other guy who's confronting the one watching porn is having an affair. You know, what sort of thing are you doing? If you're confronting somebody, then make sure that you're not trying to go off and be above them and that you are literally, one, you've got to be following God's instructions. If you're not following God's instructions, don't even worry about confronting other people. You know, that's just how it comes down to. If you're not following God's instruction, then you should just shut your mouth until you get to that point. You know, that's just how it has to be. If, if you're following God's instruction, then you can help other people grow. But until then, just go ahead and relax and sit this play out. You know, and that's just how it has to be. Sit on the sidelines and wait until, you get, until you're ready to be played on the, put on the field. Because a lot of times we get there and we go, oh, I'm a Christian and I can go confront others. No. Are you a, are you a practicing Christian or are you an acting Christian? Are you somebody that acts and acts like they do things right and they only do that for that one and a half hours that they're here? Or are you a practicing Christian and people can see that in your life all the time? Because if you're a practicing Christian, then please, by all means, show up and confront. Talk to me. Speak to me in love. But if you're an acting Christian, then just go ahead and bite your tongue. And when you get to the point where you're a practicing Christian, then let's start getting to there. Daniel confronted the king. That's exactly what he comes out. Daniel confronted the king. And he comes up and he goes, you're doing that wrong. The king didn't turn yet. And at the end of that time... I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored, and then I praised the Most High, and I honored and glorified him who lives forever. That's Daniel 4.34. Think about this. When we confront, and we confront love, and we step out, and we go, hey, I can help you grow, and you should stop doing this, then guess what happens? People recognize where it comes from, and they look, and they go, you're right. I've been following the wrong thing the whole time. I've been chasing after pride. I've been chasing after glory. I've been chasing after money. I've been chasing after all these things. 
when the whole time I should have been pursuing God because God is the one who provides and God is the one who can take away. This is exactly what happens. The king of Babylonia comes out and goes, your God is who I need to be worshiping, is who I need to be following. He is the most high. Daniel did what was right and trusted God with the results. He did what was right and trusted God with the results. Now I ask you, number one, are you trusting God with the results? Or do you just give it to him and go, God, you've got this. God, you're the one in charge. You're the one who's going to take over. Because if you won't trust him with the results, you will never, ever do what is right. Ever. You will never, ever do what is right if you won't trust God with the results. So, what do you have to start doing? You have to start getting to this point. You have to start praying and start going, God, I know that you have the best thing for me. I know that your will is going to be perfect for me. I know that I'm going to grow from this. I know where I'm going. That's where it starts at. You have to trust him with the end before you can actually trust him at the beginning. Because if you're questioning the end, why would you give it to them? Why would you go, here, God, you can have it. If you're not going to trust him with the results, why would you give anything up? It's the same thing. You know, just think about a football coach. And a lot of people in here, they go, they will watch these different games and whatever, and they get to this point. Do you see the coach give the ball to a lineman for the final play? No. You know why? Because he knows what the end result will be. It will be somebody who is slow that will be taken down. And they will not score. He knows. Well, how do you think that God is with us when he knows what our reaction is going to be when he gives us the ball? He knows that we're going to travel with it in the wrong direction. He knows that we're going to go the wrong way. And start going, why is it that God doesn't give us to prosper? Why doesn't God take care of me? Why isn't this? Have you shown God that you're going to trust him with the results? And then you're going to start following that plan and start going, God, it is yours and I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. Because if you haven't, it's very difficult for, you know, the Bible says, before I can give you a lot, I have to trust you with a little. Have you been trustworthy with a little? When God gives you a little, have you been trustworthy with it? Or is it, a, it's mine. You know, it's like, my precious. You know, you've gotten to that point. We get our bank accounts. My precious bank account. Hmm. You know, we get to this point and we start doing these things. This is how we act. We, we get all, oh, I can't give this up. Hmm. That's how our lives have, begotten, have, have become. And it's not just like with our money. It's with everything. We've gotten to this point where I can't give this up. I can't give this time up. I can't come to a group because, oh, my Tuesday nights have to be for this or that or this. We have one every night of the week. Pick one. I'm telling you, it's only six weeks. What can six weeks hurt? My precious time. Mm. That's where we've gotten. Can't give it up. And you wonder why people aren't being helped around you. You wonder why people aren't growing around you. You wonder why people, you know, I, I look at this and I go, we have this opportunity as a church to reach and help people grow. We feed and we do all these things. Guess what, guys? I can't do it on my own. I can't. But week after week after week, it's me and other senior leadership of the church going to pick up bread and doing it. I can't do it on my own and still come up here and give a message to where you walk out and go, man, did you hear him? He was talking about my precious. That doesn't work that way. It becomes to where I start getting very, very tired and it starts making it to where I get discouraged. I get discouraged because I go, I'm doing what you've asked me to do, God. Why is it that people aren't stepping up and doing what they're supposed to do? We have to start looking at this and start going, are we releasing people to ownership? Are we giving them what they're supposed to do? And when you do get that, are you afraid of taking it? Because God goes, here, here are the keys to the car. He pulls it out and he goes, you know, go run with it. And what do we do? What is the first thing we do is we take it and go, oh, the keys? Oh! And we go partying in it. And we go driving around. And then we wrap it into a telephone pole. And we've destroyed it before we've really understood what it is that God just gave us. We just destroyed it. We've taken this chance of growing and we, and we, and we just wrap it into a pole. And we go, God will give me another one. God will give me another chance. He'll give me another opportunity. And he will. Well, well, the one he just put in front of you. What about the one to help others grow? What about the one to help people stand? What about the one where you can save somebody's marriage? What about the one where you can actually start doing something different in your life? What about the one where you can actually start seeing your children grow? The opportunity where God has continued to say, here, here's another set of keys. Here's a set of keys to your house. Here's a set of keys to this. Here's a set of keys to the next car and this car. 
And what have you done with those keys? You just continue throwing them away. God, give me another one. I'll wrap it into the next hole. God, give me another one. God, give me another one. God, give me another chance. God, I, I, don't, you know, I don't understand what it means to stand out. I'm telling you right now, this is me lovingly confront you. This is what's happening right now. It's time for you to stop sitting on the sidelines and, stop and, and start going, I'm going to sit this play out because I'm not ready. I'm telling you, you are ready. You're here right now. You are ready. It's time for you to step into what God has called you to do. It's time for you to stop sitting on the sidelines and going, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, guess what? We're all afraid. We're all afraid to step out and do what God's asked us to do. It's called faith. I have the faith that God will provide for me. Even though I'm afraid, my faith is stronger than that. What is holding you back and what is preventing you from being what God has asked you to be? It's time for us to really pray on that. And maybe you do need to hit the reset button and take that chance and go, God, right now, I will follow the plan that you have laid out for me. Right now, I will start doing what you've asked me to do. Right now, I will start being able to be trusted with a lot. Because right now, I know that you haven't been able to trust me with a little. It will change, and you can do it right now. Stop sitting on the sidelines and going, oh, I'll just get the next play. I'll catch the next bus when it comes by. Your bus is right now. It's, it's pulled up right out front. It's time for us to get on and start going, God, I know that I'm here to support you, and I know that I'm here to support the ministries that you've provided. It's time for us to start doing and acting the way that he asked us to. It's time for us to start being an acting Christian, not a play Christian. And not one of these people that sits on the sidelines and goes, uh, I like calling myself a Christian, but I don't know what it really means to be one. Start moving forward and stop being afraid. God said, I'll provide. I will give to you. I give to everything else. I give to the birds and bees. What makes you think that I won't give to you? It's time to change. It's time to move forward. And it's time maybe to hit that reset button and go, God, you can trust me. God, I will do what you've asked me to do. And God, I want to follow and I want to be part of your plan. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity, this chance to stand out, this, this chance to stand up and start doing what is right. To not be afraid, to not sit on the sidelines and see these wrongs and these injustices happening and going, I'm not going to do anything about it because it's none of my business. It is our business. It's our business to love others, to help them grow and to bring them back into the fold. And God, I have been so, so lost in doing that and I want, and I want to come back. I want to be back in the fold. I want to help others grow. I want to love on other people. Instead of being judgmental, instead of being a hypocrite, instead of going, don't do that, because, and I'm going to go off and do the same thing 10 minutes after I tell you that. God, I'm ready to change, and I'm ready to start following, and I'm ready to start living the plan that you've lived out, that you've given me, that you've said, here, this is what I want you to do. I'll start picking up your word. I'll start living life for you. Where it seems that everything seems to fall into place and that you continue to provide and things are taken care of when I truly live for you. God, guide me. Lead me. Help me hit this reset button right now. Help me get back onto the right path. God, I, I know that I've been doing my own thing. I know that I've been living the life that I wanted to live and I'm ready to get back onto the path that you've laid out for me. I want to get back on the path of righteousness and start living the life that you said that I'm destined to live. I want the life where I get to come home at the end of the day or at the end of my life when I know that it's eternity with you. God, I know that you sent your son for me so that I can have that, so I can have that grace, so I can have this opportunity. But God, I haven't lived that way. And I'm ready to start and I'm ready to start living the life that you've asked me to live. I know that you tell us that new life is given to all who believe. Well, God, I believe. And I want that new life. I'm ready to step out and step into it. So I ask that I have it now. Please give me that new life that you promised. 
keeping your heads down, if you prayed that with me just now, if you prayed that you're ready for this new life, if you're ready to step out into God's plan, if you're ready to do what God has asked you to do, can you put a hand up for me? Nobody's looking at you. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to stand up. Can you put a hand out saying, I'm ready for this new life. I'm ready to do what God has asked me to do. I'm ready to start following this plan. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. I know that God is throwing a party right now that he says that you can step into this and you can do this life and eternity is promised to each of us. Gosh, thank you so much. Thank you for all that you are doing. Thank you for all that you have given and all that you have poured out for us. It is our turn to do it to our neighbors and to our loved ones. To be able to pour love out and help guide and correct. I thank you so much. And all of this we pray in your son, Jesus' name. Amen.